Uh, good afternoon or good morning and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Beth Overmo. I'm a member of the State Bar and also employed by the State Bar as the Strategic Plan Coordinator. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. First of all, do you or a lawyer or law student you know have a drug or alcohol problem or struggling with anxiety or depression? Lawyers Concern for Lawyers is a confidential and independent resource for South Dakota lawyers, law students, and their families. Your referral or visit with LCL is strictly confidential and privileged. Call Becky Porter for more information at 605-391-5191. Becky is an LCL member and your communications with her are likewise confidential and privileged. South Dakota State Bar members and their families also have access to the Sand Creek Member Assistance Program, which includes a 24-7 hotline. To reach a trained professional at any hour for a confidential discussion and assessment, please call Sand Creek at 1-888-243-5744. And I will add those phone numbers into the chat for all of our attendees. Today's presentation will last approximately one hour. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to, today, to today's presenter by typing your questions in the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during a Q&A session at the end. You can also submit them via chat. Thank you to the State Bar of South Dakota and CLE Inc. for their support of today's program. Now I would like to introduce our presenter. Tyler joined Infotech Solutions in 2015 after more than eight years at Dakota State University as Assistant Director of Admissions. Tyler grew up near Brant, South Dakota on his family farm. Upon graduating from Dakota State University with a Bachelor in Business Management, Tyler worked at Schwann's Home Service for a short period of time before returning to his alma mater. After acquiring experience in many aspects of business, he left his position as Assistant Director of Admissions to begin his current role as the Business Development Director of Infotech Solutions. In 2017, Tyler obtained his Master's in Strategic Leadership from Black Hill State University. Tyler is married to his wife, Jill, and has three boys. He enjoys hunting, fishing, being outside, and spending time with his family. And with that, here is Tyler for today's presentation. Thank you very much, Beth, appreciate it. Uh, again, my name is Tyler Rood. I'm here with Infotech Solutions in Madison, South Dakota is where our headquarters are at. Uh, thanks for attend, uh, attending the webinar. Um, uh, just a little bit of background about Infotech Solutions. Uh, we are a full managed service provider, an MSP, uh, that manages entirety of networks, including but not limited to you know, servers, managed firewalls, PC maintenance, backups, wireless, emails, Office 365, uh, endpoint detection and response. Uh, our, our services are, are quite vast. Uh, in addition to your on-site infrastructure and security, we administer phishing tests, uh, consult with PCI and, and HIPAA compliance as well too. So uh, we really pride ourselves on superior customer service and, and timeliness, timeliness to our resolutions. Um, today, we're just gonna kind of go over uh, some of the top cyber concerns that we're seeing uh, inside of, of networks and, and uh, different organizations. Uh, for us, we service multiple industries across the state. Uh, as well, we're the endorsed provider for cybersecurity and IT uh, for different associations, including the State Bar, uh, the South Dakota Retailers Association, uh, South Dakota Agribusiness Association, and the Independent Insurance Agents of South Dakota. So we are those cybersecurity experts uh, to those associations. Uh, we have clients throughout the state. We go from you know Rapid up to Bismarck, uh, Fargo, down to Yankton, and everywhere in between there. So. We do cover uh, quite a vast uh, array of, of services uh, as well as locations as well too. So um, we're going to jump right into it and just kind of see where we go. So we're trying to have a little bit of fun too, so it's not going to be all nerdy cybersecurity stuff. So uh, again, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, I'll try to keep an eye on that as much as I can. Uh, if not, we will uh, address those at the very end. And then finally, if we don't get to them, then we will, I'll, I'll make sure to follow up uh, as well. So again, we're just talking about cyber concerns today. So we do assessments for different organizations and, and we see quite a, the gamut of, I, I guess, errors, a lack of better words for some breachable opportunities, as we'll call them. Uh, obviously the biggest concern is ransomware. We all know what that is. Uh, obviously it, it's, it's, they take control of your environment or your assets and they make you pay to get them back. And that doesn't honestly um, 
even if you do pay, it doesn't mean you're going to get your 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 information back. They might still hold some of that hostage as well too. So um, that's where we're really making sure that you're monitored <clears throat> and managed organization. Uh, so we have these A steps in place, and B, if we do have a compromise, you know, we don't have to negotiate at that point. We can just wipe the system, and we can get you back up and on, uh, back up and going. Uh, the other one coming through right now is the hottest one is probably a business email compromise. We're going to talk a little bit more about that, what that actually means uh, a little bit later on. That's not phishing. They are they are different. Uh, phishing might lead to a business email compromise, uh, but they are they are different. Unpatched vulnerabilities is probably another concern too. You know, when their computers are set to automatic for their updates, um, that's some things that the uh, things happen there, and they don't necessarily get pushed out or pushed out in a timely manner. Uh, lack of multi-factor authentication is probably one of the biggest things that we're seeing right now across the board too. Um, mainly what we hear is, well, it's another step. Well, I think people are, especially the business owners, they're, they're fine at taking that other step um, after they've had a compromise at that point. So we don't want to have to learn from our mistakes. Let's just enable things right off the bat. Uh, password manager, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, we shouldn't be having a notebook. Uh, we shouldn't be having the passwords underneath a sticky note underneath the, the um, the mouse or the mouse pad or your keyboard, you know, there's things, there's better ways for that. Uh, some of the things that we're really seeing too, you know, organizations are looking at not IT, but cybersecurity and IT as an expense versus an investment. So we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later on as well too, uh, what that actually means. Um, monitored and managed versus break and fix. Um, we'll, we'll touch on that. And then finally, the, the biggest thing that we're seeing is, knowledge of IT versus cybersecurity, because they are not the same. And that's where, if we could have IT make things work, but make it secure, and that's where Infotech's kind of the middle of that Venn diagram, and that's where we kind of want to be, because we have to have them both. Uh, we have to have that teeter-totter perfect to make sure that uh, we have usability uh, as well as security at that point, too. So moving on. Talk about ransomware a little bit. We're just going to touch on some of these. Uh, Expected 65,000 ransomware attacks so far, um, and that's just so far right now. Uh, and we could hit that 100,000 pretty easily by the end of the year. Uh, honestly, it's probably going to be around November by the when we hit that. So, ransomware is always going on. It's never going to go away because people are taking this low, low, low hanging fruit, and they're still getting money. Uh, the day uh, that we we kind of stand up and make sure that these are are implemented across the board, that's where we'll start seeing ransomware go away. But when they have their opportunity, they are going to take it at that point. Uh, the most recent ones are, are Colonial, obviously. Um, that's the pipeline, JBS, and that's food. Uh, the most recent one's going to be the Kaseya, uh, which is it's very important at that point because a lot of times Kaseya is the way that MSPs connect back to their clients' computers. Uh, so when all that's been breached, that was a, a pretty big deal. So in the event you are using Kaseya or your uh, organization, um, we want to uh, change out all passwords and take a look and see if um, there are any indications of compromise inside of your organization. What's the biggest thing right now on these two in particular, the Colonial and JBS, you know, we're we're not just talking the mom and pop shops, the flower shops, uh, and, and asking for some small money at that point. You know, we're really flirting with, you know, cyber espionage and cyber warfare because those were uh, state sponsored ones. Um, and essentially, they're, they're here to create chaos and and try to uh, just make the United States not as as uh, as great as it used to be. Right. So they're really working on that and just trying to create chaos inside of our, our organizations in our nation. Um, the FBI, they did recover around half of Colonial's ransomware. Um, but when the crimes for malicious software were used by the bad guys, um, essentially they didn't go off the people that, that executed it. They went at the people that created that software. So that was kind of an interesting way that the uh, FBI went uh, on that one. So uh, the resolutions to some of these are the tax every six minutes uh, is when it's going in an average cost of $170,000. So if you have that in your budget for uh, cyber breaches, you know, let me know. I'll be more than happy to help you out there. We'll, we'll gladly do some work for you for $170,000. Uh, but let's let's just not have that happen, right? And that's where we, we really pride ourselves of not coming in and being good janitors and cleaning things up when something happens. Let's let's not have it happen to begin with. Uh, some resolutions, some of this stuff, everyone's like, well, what, what can I do to you know, not have this happen to me. Uh, the biggest thing right now is probably get your cybersecurity awareness training. So it's like a phishing training uh, to hopefully stop someone from clicking uh, 
clicking links, uh, clicking bad URLs, uh, clicking malicious uh, attachments at that point. 90% of successful breaches result from a phishing campaign. Uh, so for really training our, our end users, uh, train that finger to, to know what to look for at that point. Uh, we do some effective stuff where we, we talk about application whitelisting. So that's essentially a, a notebook, uh, figuratively, that what, what runs inside of your organization? Um, is it your Word, Excel, PowerPoint? It's probably some software that you use locally. Uh, is it translation software? Um, those are good guys. Those are the people that we know. They've been vetted. Um, and at that point, they're the only ones allowed to run inside of our, our clients' organizations. Um, we're just trying to make sure that the right people have the right keys at that point. We're not letting anyone and everyone in at that point. Uh, we're making sure we're having an effective backup strategy, not a set it and forget it and hope we have it. Uh, it's all going to be monitored and managed. Some of the newer things that are coming around is EDR, which is endpoint detection response. Um, when you have an EDR platform, we're not waiting you know, months uh, before we figure out something's running in the background that shouldn't be. Uh, we're honestly looking at minutes and hours at the most days. So um, your typical response by the time you found someone inside your organization, they've, they've been in there almost 270 days statistically and it takes another month to figure out what they're actually doing. Uh, so the EDR, if you're looking to invest, that's the best way to, to take that and be a proactive. Uh, thinking of it as almost an AI for uh, antivirus. It learns with you, learns your habits, what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a great reactive, uh, or excuse me, proactive uh, way to get into uh, or keep people out of your organizations. And we just look at this as preventative maintenance. Let's not have these things happen. So um, that's where that's where we come into play. We talked about business email compromise a little bit, and this is st straight out of the FBI's uh, web page. So this is something you guys can go look at. You know, the first step, what they're trying to do, the bad guys, the, the quote unquote hackers, they're, they're just trying to find targets at this point. Uh, exploiting information. So if you have a larger firm, more than likely a lot of your information is going to be out there. So if I go to www.tylerslawfirm.com, more than likely I have all the emails. You probably have a bio where you were, where you went to school. That's the stuff that they're they're identifying a target at that point. Um, a lot of times it's going to be grooming. Uh, that's where they're going to start trying to hit you with spear phishing emails uh, or just phishing emails in general uh, to a company official. It doesn't have to be you. Uh, it could be um, uh, your front desk receptionist at that point. So uh, they're trying to groom at that point. Um, a lot of times they'll use persuasion and pressure to manipulate, and you'll see a lot of that inside of those phishing campaigns saying, I need to have this done now. Um, are you available? I need this done in the next few minutes. Uh, something's come up. Um, that's typically how that happens. Once that person clicks that link and they give that information out, now they have full control over that person's email. And it's not just acting like them, like some people try to. It is they have full access uh, to their emails and their, their contacts and their calendars and stuff like that, too. So, again, this is straight out of uh, the FBI's um, web page here but yeah they're trying to spoof an email or a website you know if they have if you have law firm in your domain or firm they might try to throw an extra i in there and spoof that website at that point um they're going to always try to throw a link in there and an attachment at that point to try to have full full access to your your organization uh, again some solutions to this we don't we're not just going to try to you know yell that rome is burning let's let's try to have some solutions and some of the stuff that's going to help is going to be multi-factor authentication and we'll talk a little bit about what that actually means here in a second but enabling that uh, the best part about multi-factor is it's free you don't have to pay extra licensing for it it's, it's included with it if it's available right so some of the software the older software is not going to be available but the new stuff uh, and new licensing like office 365 or microsoft 365 that is stuff that you can enable at that point. So please, please, please do that. Uh, we talked about uh, cybersecurity and awareness training at that point. Uh, we'll, we'll hit on that a few different times because, again, if they always say, you know, you know, my people are my weakest link, that's where it's going to happen. You're probably right, but let's train those people to see what that looks like. So it's sending an email every month and, you know, getting a full report back saying, all right, yep, you know, Tim, he clicked it and he actually put in his information. So that's 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 bad news at that point. Uh, and then just having some protocols set into place too. So uh, let's say there is a transfer of money uh, one way or another. We're not replying via that email because if they have full uh, access to that email and say, yeah, uh, sure, yeah, it is. It is me. This is Tyler. 
when in fact it's not. Uh, so if you have some protocols set into place, if there's a transfer of money, uh, you pick up a phone and you call to verify at that point. And I think you'd be surprised how many times that's going to actually work. Uh, don't take anything for granted. Um, that's going to be the biggest thing. So uh, we have other solutions in place that we do for our organization as well. So we have it where it scans all incoming detachments and URLs for malicious content. Um, you know, just some things to think about too, you know, do you get alerts when there's a failed login attempt for one person in your organization? Uh, do you get an alert if there's a new folder made? Do you get an alert when there's a redirect or forwards? Because the first thing that they're going to do when bad guys get into a business email compromise and they have Tyler Rude's email, they're going to create all, all stuff to go to a different folder. So are we monitoring, are we flagging these indications of compromise? We do for all of our clients. Uh, we just wanna make sure that we are monitoring and managing every aspect of the email platform for our clients uh, uh, in addition to their infrastructure they have as well too. So just some things to think about for your organization. You know, why, why does it keep on working? Um, this is essentially it. It's enter your bank account number. Well, one guy, they understand that it's, it's it's spam, it's scam. Goes to the next person in the organization. She realizes, yep, that's a scam, but it all it takes is one person inside that organization to uh, impact everybody at that point. So that's why it keeps on happening. And I got another uh, another analogy here um, coming up. And the circle goes on and on and on again at that point. So again, try to have a little fun. It's not all nerd talk all the time, but that's that's long and short of it, why it keeps on keeps on happening. So a lot of the other things we're seeing are unprotected vulnerabilities inside organizations as well when we go in there and able to see it at face value, not you know, necessarily getting on um, their current providers, you know, back end of things. So we're seeing firewalls uh, that A, they're not even a firewall, they might just be a router or they're an all-in-one unit that has um, that has wireless inside of it as well as a router. Uh, firewalls should be monitored and managed at all points in time. A good example of that is um, I tried clicking a link, doing a little bit of research uh, for a different project, and one of the links is actually stemmed from Russia. That's where the, the domain was, was pushing out of. So our firewall caught that saying, nah, you probably don't need to have this one to go find something else. So that's where that you know, act of protection is happening. Uh, making sure that your firewall is segregated or segmented, um, making sure that your wireless, your guest wireless and your private wireless are separate networks, um, making sure that you're, you know, to be PCI compliant, we've got to make sure that your credit card reader or uh, credit card machine, that's on a separate network. Uh, we want to make sure that your business computers are on a separate network. Uh, so we want to make sure that that's all happening. And again, we want to make sure it's, it's monitored and managed at that point, too. So if there is a patch or a vulnerability that's considered a zero day, which zero days, this means it was just recently discovered and uh, we need to patch that, um, we can push those out in a, in a very quick notice rather than like, well, let's, let's push it out you know, next month or next year. Um, that's where, again, the monitoring comes into play uh, across the board, not even just for firewalls. Um, they need to be applied in appropriate time to and in order to make them effective at that point. Um, like right now, if you have anything on Windows 7 anymore, you need to upgrade to Windows 10. Absolutely have to. Uh, Windows 7 hasn't had upgrades since January 1 of 2020. Uh, so again, making sure that we're stick, staying up to our, our, our stuff. And that's where we're talking to our clients, you know, three years ahead of time saying, hey, budget wise, you have 20 computers, we can upgrade them or we can buy new, whatever works best for you. So uh, Office 365 is going to have um, their own patches, uh, their own vulnerabilities. If you're running even Windows anymore, uh, or just Office, excuse me. So if you have Office 2010, um, that's done, and or 
earlier, 2007, um, those are all done as well too. So there's no more patches, so they're all straight up open vulnerabilities. Um, the Microsoft operating system, making sure that those are, are patched again in a timely manner. Patch Tuesday is typically when those get patched. Um, some of them are gonna be inside that month uh, as well, just due to the availability and the, how dangerous essentially they are. Uh, third party patches like your Adobe, uh, some of those things that you're utilizing, we wanna make sure that those are patched as well. And then just making sure we have a quality patch management system. It's not just uh, Dolores is in charge of her computer and, and, and restarting it because you get going on a Monday morning and a little thing pops up in the right bottom saying, yeah, your computer needs to restart. Well, I'm busy right now. So what that does is it, your, your updates don't actually push until that computer restarts again. And then you might have more updates on top of that. So making sure that uh, everyone inside your whole organization have patches and they're restarted and they restarted. You know, do, do you get inventory audits of all that as well too? That's stuff that we can provide for our, our organizations, our clients. Um, one other thing is no one really thinks about like the conference room computer, the one that you only turn on twice a year or the traveling computer that maybe only gets turned on, you know, three times a year. Those all need patches upon patches upon patches as well too. So making sure they're protecting every asset inside of that organization is what we're seeing. Uh, again, just kind of sitting on the back shelf, but it's still connected to the server, which still is connected to QuickBooks. Um, we want to make sure we can't jump all that. So making sure we're patching as much as we can. We talked about multi-factor a little bit here. Uh, and if you don't have multi-factor, that light blue one in the middle with the token, the phone and the fingerprint, that's not there. Essentially you put your username, username in and you put your password in and then you have access. Well, with multi-factor, there's a stop gap in there. So it's username, password, and then the next step is biometrics, uh, a token that essentially it spins with random numbers on it and you have to put those random numbers in at the same time. Uh, then last is going to be uh, what most people probably utilize is their phone. It's an app on their phone that says, hey, your additional pass numbers are 57042. Please put these in inside of a two-minute time frame. Uh, and what that does is, let's say we're watching Denver Broncos maybe possibly win this weekend again to make us 3-0, which is crazy. If I'm sitting there watching that game and I have, hey, your passcode to your email is 57042 again, I'm not on my email, right? So now we have an indication of compromise that someone has my username and someone has my password. Uh, so we talked about password reuse again too, but we wanna make sure that we now know that someone has that, so I need to change my password for that, but they still didn't get access to my email. So that's where, that's the biggest thing about multi-factor. And again, it's not just email. This should be on all your social media accounts. Uh, this should be on all your bank accounts uh, across the board. Uh, it should be on anything that touches money or thinks about money. Uh, a good example of that is like, well, I don't need to have it on my Facebook. Well, we had someone call in uh, just recently saying their their Facebook was, their email password was breached for their, their Facebook. I'm like, well, it's it's hard to do, sorry. And, and you know, what can we do? He goes, well, can you get my $10,000 back? I'm like, well, what do you mean? Well, they went straight to their business profile and they have a credit card attached to it and they spent $10,000 of someone else's money marketing a different organization. So again, something simple as a 30 seconds or 10 seconds to verify that it is actually you on there is worth your time and worth your money, uh, let alone having to go talk to the FBI and get all your clients back in order again. So a little bit more on passwords. Um, you know, if, if you're looking at that top, no one's going to remember those passwords because those are statistically strong passwords. Um, no one's going to remember those, right? So we want to move it off to a password to more of a passphrase. So at this point, you know, don't make it a your password a fish or walleye. Uh, don't try to be fancy and capitalize walleye and use an at sign for the A and number ones for the Ls. Let's move it to a much larger one. So I like to fish. Um, it gets cold in the winter. It is fall 2021. Anything is better than just your regular words. If it's found in a dictionary, it can get brute forced in, in just under a second. So essentially it's just plugging in uh, a dictionary to the password and just runs through all the words that it knows about. So getting to a passphrase is most important. Uh, password reuse, we talked about that a little bit, making sure that we're not utilizing the same passwords across the board. So definitely you don't want your email password the same as your Facebook password, which is the same as your uh, investment passwords, your Widow and Read or whatever organization you utilize. Um, we want to make sure we're staying away from that password reuse. Because uh, you should, you know, you should have a unique password for each account or each service. So we want to make sure we're trying to do that. Um, 
don't give out stuff on social media. You know, you see some of these things of what was your favorite car or your first car? Or, um, what's the best thing about your hometown? And then what happens is people start just spewing information because those are a lot of times the same questions as password resets. Uh, so don't give up too much social media stuff. It's it's really honestly not worth it at that point. Uh, want to keep passwords off Excel files, off Post-it notes. We don't want to see the little black book. You know, we all had one at one time. You know, we got to use a password manager at this point. Um, you know, when we talk about spray attack, essentially what that is doing is that they find a password somewhere along the way. And at that point, they just go to all the accounts they can and they spray tack it. They, so they go to their Wells Fargo, they go to their uh, portal.office.com to try there to try to get your business email. They go to um, Facebook, they go to Wells Fargo again, they, they go everywhere and they just try to use that password as many, 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 many times as they can. So it's a pretty important deal there. But utilize a password manager, that's the biggest thing. Um, we talked about breaches a little bit. Um, you can see if your email was a part of a breach at any given time. Uh, it's kind of a little uh, lighter up here, but is it have I been pwned .com? Uh, You can put your email in there. Um, and at that point, it's going to say, yes, it has been a part of a breach, and it was the Facebook breach. It was the uh, Yahoo breach, and kind of saying you know, what, what happened there. Uh, if it's part of a breach and it's your domain account, so if it's at tylerslawfirm.com, you probably can't, you know, you can't burn that, burn that account. You probably have to just keep that one. Uh, you definitely want to switch out your password and then enable multi-factor authentication as much as you can. So you can go out there and see if you've been a part of any breach. Additional concerns uh, that we're seeing as we kind of wrap up here and, and offer any questions. I haven't seen any come through, so this would be a good time to throw throw any out there uh, if you want to, and we'll be sure to address them here in a little bit. But the biggest thing is we're not seeing people actually have a, a vested interest inside their organizations. So we see warranties expire. Uh, we see that they are utilizing just maybe a single server. Uh, so right now, if a server goes down inside your organization, that's all you have, and it's your domain controller. We are switching out servers, you know, on a monthly basis. Of some of our organizations that are coming up end of life, and it's taken upwards of three months to get a server. Can you be down for three months? most of you're going to say no way, especially when you have court cases pending, uh, stuff like that. So we're not seeing a full vested interest or an expert in not only cybersecurity, but just IT in general. Um, that's probably one of the bigger things that we see of how long can you be down? And a lot of people are going to say, I can't. So we have, we have uh, different things that we have for our organizations. Uh, I'll tell you right now, the organizations that have uh, invested into a true cybersecurity firm, they sleep a lot better at night knowing that their stuff, uh, their stuff's taken care of at the end of the day. Um, if it's still an, a, a, if it's still an expense to your organization, it's always going to linger until it becomes a reality if you're going to get breached or not. It's just a matter of of if it's going to be when. If you're not, in, you know, putting that into a, you know, ex, you know, if you're look, viewing it as an expense at that point. Um, Monitor to manage versus break and fix. You know, we a lot of like I got a guy, I got a guy, I got a person that comes in and I'll just call him whenever something happens. Well, what happens once something happens and and you're saying I thought you had that covered? Well, you didn't tell me to do that. Well, yeah, well I noticed you had a broken arm, but you asked me about the sliver in your finger. Well, that's kind of the things. It's making sure it's monitored and managed across the board. Um, you know, honestly, what's what's the point of hooking up a fire system? You know, if the ones uh, that pull alarm they see smoke or fire, you know, it's they, it doesn't go anywhere. The alarm just, it's a light inside that organization. So uh, making sure you're monitored and managed at all times. Uh, we see a huge sense of false, uh, false sense of security and risk. Uh, so that's where those assessments come into play. We're able to say, you know, at face value, this is, this is your breachable things. You know, we, you know, your server sitting out in the middle of the hallway. Anyone can grab that at any given time. Uh, you don't have permission set. So your intern, uh, can come in and walk all the way up to the QuickBooks file. So just little things like that. It, it's definitely a false sense of security and risk, what we see at the end of the day, saying, well, I thought I had that taken care of. Well, we can see right here that it is definitely not getting taken care of. 
you know, an internet service provider, they're, they're not cybersecurity. Uh, a software provider, they're not cybersecurity. Um, they're definitely not cybersecurity because a lot of times they will turn things off just to make sure their stuff works at that point. You know, one individual is not cybersecurity. So we see too many times where the, own, the owner or the agent, they're not aware of their actual risk when it comes down to the whole organization and what one breach can mean to their legacy. Uh, not only the pocketbook, but their legacy. You know, there's other lawyers out there. Uh, if they see across the news that you had a breach, they're probably gonna go somewhere else, right? So just their legacy in general. Um, you know, what happens if you have to tell your whole clientele that, you know, something happened, but trust me, we got it taken care of. Um, and unfortunately that that news doesn't spread slow it spreads pretty fast pretty quick so um and again the last thing is, is it help versus cybersecurity, and there is a difference there so and i have one last slide here to kind of talk about that so again we talked about that venn diagram because we have it which is information technology on the left and we have cybersecurity on the right so the top priority for it is you know ensuring the hardware and software are essentially functional um, and then the cybersecurity is, you know, let's protect those that data and those assets. Again, down on the IT side, responsible for hardware, software, and new technology. Um, the IT or the cybersecurity portion of that is, what's the risks with these things by an end user? IT is putting controls in place. <laughs> cybersecurity is monitoring those controls. Staying up to date, uh, stays up to date on the threats, right? And the very last one, or the other one was offered uh, in uptime and how often are you are up or not down. And the other one's gonna be for cybersecurity is gonna be recommendation and prioritizes actions and steps and solutions. We talked about you know having two servers or having a data in a server. So if that server goes down, how long can you be down? Two minutes, two hours, two weeks, two months? Uh, those are questions that you need to be asking at that point. Uh, the last one here is a fix it mentality, and then cybersecurity is secure it mentality. And if you were to draw a big circle right down the middle of that, that's where Infotech Solutions is. It's the IT portion of it, making sure it's up and running, and then also secure uh, as well, too. So um, lastly, like us, follow us. Um, we're out on social media. We, we post some tips and tricks every once in a while uh, about what to do and, more importantly, what not to do. Um, yeah, that's probably the biggest thing. And then uh, I'm looking for any questions. Doesn't look like any has come up, but if you have any questions in particular that you don't want to um, you know, air your dirty laundry out, shoot me an email. Be more than happy to help you out. Uh, we do free assessments as well too. Uh, so feel free to, if you want to see how your organization sits uh, when it comes to cybersecurity, shoot me an email. Be more than happy to come out and take a look. So uh, with that being said, uh, I again, still don't see any questions that have come up. Tyler, are you able to hear me now? I can hear you, Bob. Fantastic. It took a little while to get the audio. For those that are, are listening, this is Bob Peacehall. I was supposed to be the presenter at the beginning, but I couldn't get my microphone working. Um, I'm a sole practice lawyer in, in Flandreau, South Dakota, and this is my first year on this committee. We tested out this software and it worked fine two days ago, but for some reason today I had to re-download it onto my phone and that's what I'm using now. Um, this is the time for question and answers. Uh, Tyler has access to the chat window and indicated that there weren't any. I do have one question for you, Tyler, that maybe you can help me out with. Yeah. So uh, you've given us kind of a list of, of different security concerns, keeping your software updated, uh, doing multi-factor authentication, uh, having redundant systems like a backup server, uh, or, or even uh, enlisting a managed uh, security uh, organization like Infotech. From the perspective of uh, a small law firm, I'm on that committee too, I suspect that not every firm is able to do all of those things or certainly not all at once. Is there sort of a priority list for the, the different steps that a, a small organization would want to take? Like which of these is the most significant or, or is going to get them the most bang for their security buck? Yeah, no, for sure. And, and like I said, our, our services goes across the board from, you know, small firms like yourself all the way up to, uh, you know, 100 computer organizations. And, you know, the, the budget's not the same and we understand that. So probably the biggest bang for your buck that you can do, it's free. It's that multi-factor authentication, um, making sure that you have that ability to have that additional uh, pass code sent to you or you have that um uh, app on your phone that it, it links to as well too. So making sure that you can see that. Uh, outside of that, it's probably going to be looking at making sure you have a backup solution. Uh, that's going to be the biggest thing. You know, they talk about three, two, one is your your, your analogy. You have three different uh, 
three different copies, um, two different platforms and one's off site or in the cloud. So that's gonna be the biggest thing. So in the event something does happen, we have a backup of it somewhere. And people, a lot of people say, hey, yeah, I got one on my thumb drive that I, I, I switch out every day, I switch out every week. Well, where do you put it? Well, I bring it home. Like, oh, how cold was your pickup or your vehicle when it was 30 below out? Well, yeah. Uh, so, or how hot was it when it was 100 degrees out? Uh, where do you store it? So there's a lot of different things that can happen with those those backup plans too, and that's why we've got to make sure it's monitored and managed. We had an organization uh, before they came on with us, they had a thumb drive and the first file was corrupt. So for years, they were taking home thumb drives that it didn't matter. So that's probably the biggest thing. And then you start looking at your, you know, some of your other security. So like your firewalls, again, making sure those are monitored and managed. And then just being having someone that's that's watching over that stuff for you. So. That's how I'd probably prioritize them. The EDR, the endpoint detection response, is probably the biggest, newest thing out there at the moment. Um, that's, you know, Microsoft doing a really good job on and putting some R&D into that. But yeah, absolutely Aww. good question. I don't, and again, I can't see the chat window on this particular device, but uh, right. I don't know that there are any other questions, unless you see any. I don't, no. Right, well, do you have one. Hey, yeah, hey, hey, awesome. When you first detect a breach, what should be your first steps? Unplug everything. No, I don't, I, that's probably a little facetious, but yeah, you know, sometimes it is. If you start seeing things happen, unplug your computer. Uh, if it doesn't have power, it can't do anything at that point. So um, I would shut everything down uh, to the best you can and notify your organization. You know, if it is uh, Infotech Solutions uh, saying, I, I do feel like we have something, and then you kind of have to do your next steps. If you're talking with the FBI, if you're talking to um, the state out in Pier, uh, they'll have some guidance for you in that part. But main thing is just stop what you're doing and shut things down as quick as you can. Great question. Uh, I got another one that comes to my mind. Is there an advantage in encrypting the data that you store locally? Oh, absolutely. Uh, all all data should be encrypted. Um, there's so many things that can happen with that. You know, everyone worries about, you know, what what uh, is going to happen if I get breached. Well, what happens for a smash and grab? You know, if you're down, down in Sioux Falls, uh, the Washington Redskins are a good example of that. Uh, they had, uh, or excuse me, Washington football team. Uh, their athletic trainer got a their window back window smashed out, and they took their laptop, and it wasn't encrypted, so they had to consider that a full scale breach uh, at that point. So just something simple as that. Uh, yeah, you should have encryption in transit. You should have encryption sitting. Um, yeah, absolutely, it should be encrypted. And even something, you know, you want to make sure that you're able to, um, you know, going a little further down that line, if you do have remote assets like laptops and stuff like that, do you have the ability to uh, wipe them remotely? Um, are they, do they have a crypto locker on it so someone can't just pull out that hard drive? You know, oh, it's good. They don't have my passwords or my username. Well, there's, unfortunately, there's, you know, bad guys that have uh, created their, you know, my, are honed in their craft a little bit and all they have to do is pop out that hard drive and they can bypass all passwords at that point. So having a, you know, a bit locker or something like that on your, your laptops is very important. So again, it's full scale watching every single corner of your organization because if you slip up in one spot, it doesn't matter what you have in place, you're, you're in breach mode. All right. Well, it doesn't look like there are any other questions coming down the queue. No, um, I uh, I see that as well too. So. so I think we can probably call it call it good there. Thank you, Tyler, for for providing this information for us and uh, to everybody in attendance. If you have any additional questions, you can contact the state bar. The email address is info at sdbar.net, and uh, we can get those questions relayed to our presenters. Um, once you leave the webinar today, you should receive a survey on the presentation. The bar would appreciate it if you complete that and provide some feedback. But otherwise. On behalf of the State Bar of South Dakota, and, and personally, thank you all who made it today. I hope you have a, a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, too. Have a great day.